Hello again, art history students. Welcome to another little lecture. So last time, the last lecture was on the Italian Renaissance. So we're going to move forward in time in Italy into the Mannerist period, which is basically like a, an in-between phase, in between the High Italian Renaissance and the Baroque era. So this is the way it's broken down. Remember we talked about how the Venetian Renaissance is like a geographical Renaissance. It takes specifically takes place in and around Venice, similar to how the Northern Renaissance is separate. So the early Italian Renaissance evolved into the High Italian Renaissance, which evolves into Mannerism, which then leads to the Baroque era, which is what we will talk about, the last thing that we'll talk about in this lecture. Okay, so mannerism is this exaggerated time in art. So compositions are very chaotic and there's great emotional intensity. We're going to talk a lot about light and value today. And there's this kind of this theatrical quality. There's this imagination and sort of this Un, there's no longer that super strong tie to realism, right? If you remember about the high Italian Renaissance, there was this interest in perspective and how the real world worked. And we talked kind of in depth about those halos, right? In Masakio's um, tribute bunny that kind of responded to real world, if the halo was a real thing, how it would move and how it would change in space with your head there's no law that is kind of abandoned during the mannerist period and it's very much so about evoking an emotion if you remember way way back to the greek lecture we talked about the hellenistic period we talked about the archaic period and then the classical greece and then the hellenistic period was this last phase and it had this heightened drama and when we talked about this statue of lacoon and his sons we talked about how all the muscles in the body are bulging all at once and how it's paying attention to the most dramatic part of this story the part when these like kind of like sea serpent type things come out of the ocean to attack lacoon and his sons right it was very drama well this statue was excavated in 1506 and then placed on public display so people were suddenly aware of this hellenistic period and this over exaggeration that took part in the late greek artwork and that was very very um influential so here we see um el greco's re this is a painting that is a reinterpretation of that same story from antiquity of lacoon and his sons this is the exact same moment that's being depicted in this painting right it's the moment when those sea serpents come out right and they're destroying they see lacoon there he's kind of the focal point and then his sons are kind of all around him right we see the kind of male nude body which is also being taken from antiquity from greek and roman sculpture but there's also some new kind of things going on there is this heightened drama there is not this interest in this super accurate depiction of the body, right? It's bodies are kind of elongated. They kind of seem to be slightly floating a little bit over here with these, let's get a different color, with these kind of characters. There's also this really strange light source. Like where is the light coming from? Is it coming from above in the sky? Is it coming from below like a theater lighting would be, right? Where the lights are shown from the bottom of the stage up there's just this kind of strange light and shadow that's being cast is it coming from this side or this side All right and that's going to evolve so keep that in mind All right. this is another image from the mannerist period this is a little bit more of a common depiction that we've seen up into this point this is mary which is known as the madonna and then the baby Jesus. But there's also some other kind of weird 
mannerist elements, right? The body of the child seems to be very elongated, doesn't look supernatural. There's all of these people packed onto this side of the image. And yet on the other side, we have this kind of openness. There is um, this column here, and then the outline of a building, which kind of resembles a Greek and Roman kind of place that they might be at, but there's not, there's this character in the background, which seems to be kind of out of scale. Is he, how far back is he? He seems to be like not quite properly aligned with the understanding of like recession into space, like we learned about with perspective during the high time renaissance. He seems to be very kind of odd. Um, again, the Madonna, her body seems to be elongated. She is in blue, which is part of Mary or the Madonna's my iconographical identity, right? But there's also this slight sexualization of Mary, which is very odd in um, art history. It does not happen very often. So this mannerist image of Mary is like if you were to kind of merge a Venus and Mary, which is not typical for the depiction of either. Venus is never really depicted as a mother figure and Mary is rarely depicted as kind of a beautiful lustful individual right she has this maternal quality and that is what her quality is so there's this kind of oddness to this painting in a multitude of ways so the mannerists are very much so experimenting with the emotional response that you would give to a painting just for clarity's sake we already talked about this artwork which was michelangelo's um last judgment right so Michelangelo had a very long career. It spanned his entire life. He was very, very famous, and very popular. He technically has a foot in both the high Italian Renaissance and the Mannerist period. Art historians consider this artwork to be Mannerist and some of his other artworks to be of the high Italian Renaissance. He also just happened to be working right at the kind of transitional period between one and the other, the 1500s um, kind of time frame into the early uh, 1600s when Mannerist kind of evolved into Baroque. I only tell you this just to make sure that you have all of the information that artists are not always clearly and concisely in one group. Um, they can often evolve, create a new group, that kind of stuff. And that will become more apparent when we get farther into art history. But just for clarity's sake, I wanna make sure that you guys understand. And you can kind of see how this is manners. It's very emotional. It has that weird light source. The light source actually is kind of radiating, sorry, kind of radiating out from the center in all directions. Like these people, the back of them is in shadow. And then over here, the back of these is in shadow. So it's kind of radiating out from the center. It's a very unnatural light source. Okay. This is a Last Supper, which is part of the Mannerist um, kind of ideas are being depicted here. This is the third Last Supper that we've seen in this unit alone, right? We saw Albert Durer's and then we saw Michelangelo's and now we're seeing a Mannerist, right? So we're seeing again, those kind of dramatic light sources and kind of theater style lighting. Look at all the shadows that are being cast. The table is depicted at this diagonal line, which kind of tr creates this sense of drama, recession into space, and this kind of kilter, right, as it moves and flows back in space. There's also that ex weird light sources that are kind of coming from both this light that's hanging above in the corner of the image and then around the halo seems to be radiating light. There's also these imagined kind of translucent angel figures all around the light source and then all around uh, other areas of the room. They're kind of half smoke, half um, angel, right? This is a very imaginative quality. This is not, it's, there's no, no, like passage in the Bible that these characters were there or anything like that, the angels specifically. So it's a very imagined, 
theatrical depiction of the Last Supper, which we've seen other depictions that we could compare and contrast it to. All right, this is the deposition, which is basically the removal of Christ from the, the cross, is what this is an image of. So as you see it, I want you to think about the balance and the symmetry. Kind of just look at it for a moment and where does your eye go first, second, third? What seems to be the balancing point, right? It's not completely symmetrical, obviously. How is, how is this artwork kind of um, balanced? So when most folks see it, we would talk about it if we were in class together. But when most folks kind of see this artwork, their eyes kind of start here. And then there's kind of this spiral shape that's created. And then all of that kind of swirling spiral at the top of the image seems to be balanced right here on these kind of toes of this one character in the image, right? And it creates this whole as you look at it, it almost looks like everyone in the picture could just fall to one side or the other, right? The whole thing is kind of about to collapse, which is also kind of an element of drama, right? By using this sp spiral, like this radial symmetry, and then this kind of slight tedious sense of balance, it kind of creates a slight amount of angst or of drama in you as the viewer. I love this artwork, by the way. So now we're gonna talk about the evolution from the Renaissance and some of the Renaissance ideas to the Baroque, which is kind of what we've been leading to with talking about that man, with talking about the Mannerist movement, which again is kind of like a, like a, it's a moment in between two times where artists are not quite done with the Renaissance, but not quite begun the Baroque era. So let's look at these three depictions of David and kind of talk about the evolution. So we're going to compare the characteristics of time, medium, size, um, the overall effect, and then the moment of the story. That's going to also be important. So this is Donatello's David. This was the early Italian Renaissance. So of the three Davids that we're looking at, this one happens earliest chronologically in time. It was made first, but the moment of the story that it depicts is the end of the story, right? David has already conquered Goliath. We can see um, Goliath down here, right? This is a full scale um, male nude. It was the first to be created since antiquity, right? Since the Greeks and Romans made, uh, the pagan Greeks and Romans of old made uh, this lost wax bronze cast statue, right? We talked about that when we talked about the Greek period, that process, right? So it's a big deal, right? There was this really kind of crash as far as prosperity goes and as far as like the art that was made during that migration period, the fall of Rome, the uh, Black Death, right? There wasn't a whole lot of art made. There wasn't, a, I mean, not that there wasn't art made, but there wasn't art made at this scale. There wasn't the ability to create these kinds of things. It was a low prosperity moment. So this draws a lot of, um, a lot of influence from that antiquity. Right, which is the contrapposto stance, the idealized um, male nude. He's also very youthful, right? So there's all these kind of things which are also talking about the moment. The part of the story that's being depicted, which is the end, is kind of a victorious moment. And this is the early Italian Renaissance is a victorious moment in history. We can compare that to Michelangelo's David, which comes from the high Italian Renaissance, right? This also has the, excuse me, the contrapposto stance and the classical athletic body, right? This kind of idealized nude male, right? But we see a moment in time right before the action is about to happen, right? David's got his little slingshot thing kind of draped over his shoulder, but we don't, it's, it's not an, it's not apparent. It's not 
a focal point for sure. It's almost barely noticeable. What is what is attracted, what your eye is attracted to, is the idealized male body and then also sort of the eyes and the head. Everything is happening in this intellectual kind of experience, right? David is thinking about how he's going to have this achievement, how he's going to conquer this. Right? And the high Italian Renaissance was all about intellectual achievement. How do we engineer this? How does this work? How does the real world work with how can we make things better, right? It was an explosion of ideas and intellect in society. And that's reflected in this artwork. Now we're moving into the Baroque. So this is Bernini's David. This is Baroque. It's very different than the other two. David is, you know, very athletic body and whatnot, but it's not the same type of depiction. It's not that ca classical contraposto stance. Here we see David in a moment of action. It almost looks like a freeze frame from a, um, like a superhero movie or something, right? We see his face in this depiction. You're meant to kind of walk around this it's meant to be viewed three-dimensionally in the round, but we see this kind of the moment of grit, the moment of action on David's face, right, as he's about to launch the stone. So this is actually the slingshot and little stone thing that's going on here, right? This is what the mannerists were talking about, this kind of, this moment of drama, right? This moment where, at the moment that David releases the stone from the sling, that is the moment when basically to use kind of like a, a gambling kind of thing that everything is out of, out of the person's hands at that moment, right? When you roll the die, there's nothing, there's nothing else that you can do until they land, whether they land on Goliath or whether it just falls on the ground, right? It's like completely out of your control at that moment. So that is the, the moment that's being depicted, the moment of most action, most drama, most kind of um, slight amount of angst that happens in those moments. There's also a lot of diagonal lines which indicate action and drama, right? This entire sculpture is no line, is straight, right? Think about the other two. Let's look at all three of them together. If we look at the first two from the early and high Italian Renaissance, there is this, right, this straight line that goes down vertically down both those bodies, right? And straight lines create a sense of stability and authority, right? In the Baroque era, we have none of that. There is no stability, right? Everything is in this active moment. And that is really what the Baroque is about, is about that active moment, that action and that drama. Right? So that's the one thing I want you to really think about. This is also what your discussion is about. So I would maybe key into some of those factors that we just talked about. All right, so now we're talking about Baroque Europe. All right, so there are the three Davids again. All right, so the Baroque era is a time of exploration. There are frequent battles all over Europe, right? So this is Italy and what would have been the Northern Renaissance, right? So this whole area um, is really in turmoil. Um, and this dramatic composition and these moments of action that are being depicted are reflective of that turmoil. Also with the light, the light becomes very, very important in the Baroque period. So this is kind of a map of Baroque Europe. And if you look at this section from Italy up into Germany, look at all those little teeny tiny countries, right? These little teeny tiny people who are ruling everything. This is really a time frame in history when there's all kinds of power around, but none of it is consolidated. Um, you know kings and queens and dukes and duchesses and 
whatever people of power are stabbing each other in the back and going to war with each other and creating alliances and then breaking those alliances right it's a very dramatic moment in history and the art is reflecting that for sure so this is another bernini sculpture this is the ecstasy of saint teresa so in this biblical story saint teresa is essentially um an angel comes down and pierces her in the heart with an arrow and thus she's able to to go to heaven she's no longer in pain and suffering at that moment right so if this happens to you right and that moment right before you're about to be stabbed in the heart with an arrow that's the most dramatic thing that's happening to you that day for sure right and that's the moment that's being depicted here is that moment just before the drama happens right that moment of action that's about to happen that little uh smiling angel right there is about to launch that arrow so we kind of see this very that that moment of drama is the moment that's being depicted all right. Here's another Bernini sculpture. This is Apollo and Delphine. This is a story from antiquity, right? Apollo is the Greek god who pursued Delphine um, in a very unrelenting way. Right? Pursued her in a way that is very unacceptable. Um, especially by our standards today. And Delphine, rather than, than dealing with that, she decides she prays to her father, who is a god, to turn her into a tree because she'd rather be a tree than be raped. Um, so this is that moment, right? She is actively turning into a tree, right? Her feet are here as roots, right? As he is just about to kind of get his hands on her is that exact moment so it's the most dramatic moment of the story for sure the moment that you turn into a tree that's the most dramatic part of your day <laughs> all right so kind of back to kind of talking about this constant warfare and as artists are memorializing these battles and whatnot there is still this division between catholic and protestant right this event in history does not go away quickly uh it sticks around for a very long time and is very very influential a lot of art especially as we talked about with the italian renaissance is very closely tied to the patronage of the church and thus the these things can cannot be separated from each other art is not separate from anything in the human experience it's all interlocked whether it's economy or society or belief structures or um, who is in power or how they got to power all these things are always going to be intertwined with art uh, so this is the rape of a sabine so this artwork we're going to compare and contrast it to one that we saw before so here I have the Capitoline Wolf, which if you remember from, this was the earliest Roman artwork, technically part of the Etruscan period. And it this artwork depicts the um, story of the founding of Rome, right? The mythical story of the founding of Rome, the fable, right? Where these two boys who were the um, abandoned sons of the god of Mars, Romulus and Remus are their names, right they are abandoned and then this wolf finds them and cares for them and she is sort of the mother of rome right she is this one who and we talked a lot quite a bit if you remember in the lecture about this kind of angst on her face right her body looks like it has kind of been um she doesn't look super healthy she doesn't look super happy it's not a very beautiful maternal image of this mother wolf she's not cuddling with them happily right so here we have another story which is a more realistic story of the beginning or the origins of rome if you remember the rome started out as an etruscan city-state and that etruscan city-state was 
major its major population was outcast from other city states so people who could not quite follow the rules of society were pushed out of the city states and had to go live in in rome and um as all of these i don't want to say criminals but as all of these outcasts all of these people who um you know not prisoners not but just just not 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 the elite not the the high morals of society did not exist in rome at this early early time but they knew they wanted to be a powerful force so they said in order to do this we need women to give birth to children that will be the sons of rome and keep up our population right so they all these outcast people went to a neighboring town city state which was called sabine and captured all of the women and took them back to rome to be the mothers of rome right so here we have two stories of the same foundation right the foundation of rome one is a mythical story which involves this wolf that is caring for as the mother of Rome. And the other is a very realistic, graphic depiction of real events that took place, the rape of, the, of a Sabine. So Sabine is a place, just, just to clarify, and all the women were taken from there and brought back to Rome, and then they became the mothers of Rome. So there's a little bit of a reconciliation about the past that's kind of going on at this time, and sort of the the kind of terrible origin story, right? I could th still think that there's a lot when you, especially when you compare and contrast the Capitoline Wolf with the true story of the Sabine women and the origins of Rome, right? There sort of seems to be this like this sculpture is not necessarily lying right in this kind of like the angst on that wolf's face and sort of the way the body is sort of like uh, physically not in good shape right the way those the the teeth the milk things of the wolf are hanging down kind of like they've been used and abused too much that kind of thing so there's a lot of parallels that can be made both in a realistic sense and then in sort of like a symbolic sense, both about the true origins of Rome. That's one thing I want you guys to really understand for the test. This artwork will definitely be on the test. All right. Next, as we move through the um, Baroque period, we come to a character named Caravaggio. Remember, this unit is the unit of names. You're going to need to know this name, Caravaggio. So this is the confer conversion of Paul, sometimes referred to as Saul. Right? So the story of this goes that Paul is on this horse and he's having this kind of doubting Thomas moment where he is uh, not converting to, uh, to the belief structure of Christianity, right? He's like, no, 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 no. And then he falls off of the horse and I guess hits his head and has this moment of clarity and then converts, right? So that's what we see here is that conversion moment, right? Where he has fallen off of the horse. And I guess in the Baroque kind of uh, theme, if you fall off of a horse, that's probably the most dramatic thing that's happened to you today, right? We have that strange kind of dramatic light source, right? Um, kind of the darkness almost dominates the image and the the contrast between the lights and darks especially on that arm that you see is very very stark right think about half of the arm is in shadow and then half of it in light it's a very very stark contrast let's look at more of caravaggio's work this is the crucifixion of saint peter so saint peter was um always said that if he was to be crucified by the romans that he would want to be done so on a cross that is upside down so this is the hoisting of that right so we have a lot of those diagonal intersecting lines right which indicate action and drama again that strange light source where is the light coming from right why is the light coming sort of from below these characters right the background is almost completely devoid because it is black it's like 
It's like they're in a theater lighting, right? Also, a lot of action and drama. If you're crucified on a cross, it's the most dramatic thing that's happened to you that day, and that's the most dramatic part of the story that's being depicted. This brings us to a new vocabulary word, which builds on a vocabulary word that we learned last time. This was tenebrism. Tenebrism is that that gloomy darkness, right? That we see this almost a devoid background in a lot of these paintings because there's so much black. It is this stark contrast between a light source and the darkness behind it, right? And this almost becomes like a dominant figure in the image. And let's look at another Caravaggio painting that I think is the perfect example of tenebrism. This is Judith decapitating Hall of Fernies. Right? This is a story that we talked about way back at the beginning, like lecture two in unit one of the class, which wasn't even, that was before we even started our history. Right? So Judith decapitating Hall of Fernies, the short version of the story is uh, Holofernes is the commander of this massive army. He's going to um, to conquer this town, and there's this famed beauty there named Judith. So she decides to take it upon herself to save her her community, and goes and um, tempts Holofernes in his tent, which is where they are in this setting. Right, you can see the tent is the background, but it almost looks like it's its own kind of ominous figure in the background, right? So she goes to tempt him and then ultimately saves her community by committing this horrible atrocity. And in the spirit of Baroque, the most dramatic thing that's happening to any of these characters today is the thing that's being depicted, right? So if you do need a little refresher on this, I will kind of show you the artwork that we first talked about it, which is um, Artisma Gernaleski's Judith Decapitating Hall of Fernies. So um, Artisma Gernaleski was very influenced by Caravaggio, right? And we can see that. We see all of these Baroque elements coming forward in these two paintings, right? This dramatic light source, the dramatic, um, depiction from the story, right? The content of the artwork is very dramatic, very gruesome, right? There's that tenebrism, right? That extremely pronounced chiaroscuro. All of those diagonal lines are leading our eye, indicating drama, indicating action as diagonal lines do, and drawing our attention on that kind of gruesome focal point right there in the beginning. So let's look at another of Artisma Gorleski's images as we compare it to an older image. So this um, image by Artisma Gorleski for Judith and Holofernes is actually part of a series where she tells the entire story of Judith. And um, this is kind of a, the next example. So Artisma Gorleski is a woman, right? And it was very difficult for women to break the glass ceiling of being an artist, especially at this time. She was well positioned to do so because her father, Baranzo Grinaleski, I love that name, um, was also an artist. So he's working a little before Caravaggio. And this is his depiction of Judith and her maidservant with the head of Holofernes. So we see some kind of things that are familiar, right? We see the dark background, we see the, the bright kind of foreground, right? But we don't see the same, the same level of drama, right? As we do here with Judith and her maidservant, right? The way that Judith has her hand kind of out to shadow her face, right there as she's looking, right? The, the part in the story that both of these images are depicting is, as these women are about to flee and go back to their community, they hear noises and they're almost caught, right? And that's, that's you know, that's a pretty heightened drama, dramatic moment, right? You feel a little bit of angst if it were to be uh, a movie or something like that. You would, you would feel that fear for them. And in the image by Artisma Gernaleski, 
right? The, the light almost becomes like a character. It's almost symbolic of what's happening to Judith, right? Half of her face is in this bright light as she's done this thing for her community, but part of her face is very much in this dark shadow as this act, this event that has just taken place, right? It's kind of this dual um, symbolic use of light, right? Which is really what tenebrism is about. It's this darkness here is not the same as this darkness and sort of this tent like character. It almost looks like at any moment that red thing is going to jump out and kind of capture her or something, right? It's kind of this this play, this use of all these elements adds to that level of drama. Not that Aronzo Gernaleski's image is not beautiful in its own right or that it doesn't depict the same thing. It's just Artismas is really getting to a lot of the psychology and a lot of the other elements that are part of the story. So moving on, there is Artisma Gernaleski as um, in a self-portrait of her painting. So she's another name that will probably be on the test along with Caravaggio. Remember, she comes after him. She was very inspired by him and by this kind of development of tenebrism as a visual characteristic that also kind of indicates this gloomy, you know, actions and internal feelings and whatnot. It's almost kind of like a, a use of light as a psychological tool. All right. So this string brings us to the triumph of Bacchus, which the ceiling of this, um, which is in a gallery, this is just in a, uh, like someone's home. This is not in a church, just, just for clarity's sake. And, but it's kind of borrowing a lot of things that we saw from the high Italian Renaissance, specifically from Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, right? So there's this kind of faux use of these like figures or sculptures that aren't really there, but they're painted like they were projecting out from the space, like they are real elements. The same way with all of these frames, all of these frames that kind of break up this, right? Just so we're clear, this is like a a hallway ceiling right this is this is real architecture here right you can see that the wall is kind of going down like this right and this is like a domed um not a domed but like a vaulted ceiling right it's kind of like a long cylinder type thing so all of that that you see inside of there is all flush it's just painted to look like it's coming out and receding into our space, like it's coming into our space. It's definitely borrowing from the high Italian Renaissance, but it doesn't depict the same thing. This is a depiction of Bacchus, right? So if you remember, we mentioned his name before. He is the Roman god of wine and harvest and a good time, right? So there's nothing religious about this. There's also not a whole lot that's super historical about it, right? There's kind of this, as people are making artwork in this style, they're kind of merging these styles in the Baroque era of this still this interest in antiquity, but it's not quite in the same reverence, right? It's not about like, this happened you know what i mean and we're so proud of this as part of our heritage it's kind of becoming a little bit of a um just kind of a placeholder for imagery right what else are you going to put imagery about well we'll put it about greek stories and whatnot so it also kind of shows how architecture is changing so barack Bar Baroque architecture incorporates a lot of complex forms. There is no longer an interest in perfect symmetry. Irregular shapes are becoming um, interested. And this is also, this is borrowing architecture is a little bit behind 
um, painting and whatnot. So this kind of drama that's being depicted in a lot of the sculpture and a lot of the um, artwork of the time, like paintings and whatnot, is then works its way into architecture. So this church, the exterior of it has a few elements that we're familiar with, right? Like these, um, the pillar capitals, and then sort of just just kind of the pillars and these niches with these religious characters in it, which we have also seen before. But it also has this kind of organic curve and these kind of pointy things happening up at the top. So let's look at the layout of the building. This is the interior of the church, which is, again, is a circle. It's it's not, there was so much interest and intention put into the layout of a church, right? Specifically with that Latin cross plan up into this point. And now there's kind of this experimentation with organic shapes and sort of these angular lines that curve. It's very much very different from the art that we would have seen, especially in the high Italian Renaissance or the architecture that we would have seen. Sorry. So this, everything that we saw with the Baroque will lead into what's going to happen next. So this super kind of high drama, high angst, high use of light and angular lines and the most dramatic part of the story that's all going to keep evolving into what happens next so these are your key terms if you have any that you don't understand please email me also remember to check the discussion for this week and i hope you guys all stay happy and healthy thank you